traditionally university students, mathematicians, physicists, and those of other natural specialities study mechanics for many years. Beforehand, in secondary school, the boys and girls have to listen to stories of the Galileo and Newton's experiments and learn primitive vector equations of classical mechanics. The university enriches this knowledge by means of mathematical analysis and differential equations. Soon in a year, college professors mercilessly burden the students with the puzzle of analytical mechanics, which the Nobel Prize winner Eugen Wigner called incomprehensible. Next surprise arises when the Maxwell electrodynamics all of a sudden violating the Galileo's group and bringing to life the Lorentz transformations of space coordinates and time intervals. So for a half of a year, the students have to study 4x4 four four square Lorentz matrices and try to realize why invariance of the space-time intervals of Einstein's relativistic mechanics should be linked with equations of electricity and magnetism. However, the last blow eventually comes from quantum mechanics, with its postulates not fully understood by anyone, including the professors who normally warn the students. Just memorize the axioms, but don't try to understand. Thus, after three years of intensive studies, the students find themselves left with vague impression of integrity and consistency of the theory of mechanics, and with the unanswered question, what was it? However, it turns out that the full content of mechanics can be revealed just in a few classroom hours, and it will be a unique, consequent, and logically consistent presentation. Moreover, it will provide the listeners with a set of new geometric images that visually help to explain the essence of physical entities beforehand considered only as abstract notions. In this short presentation, I'll try to outline the main features of this study that I would name a general theory of mechanics. The main idea of the study is very simple. We know that all branches of mechanics, beginning from classical mechanics and finishing with quantum one, are very mathematical. So we may suspect, or it may be a confidence, that one day we'll be lucky to discover raw formulas describing fundamental mechanical laws somewhere in a good though specific math. Well, this idea seems to have found its realization when you deeply plunge into exploration of the so-called quaternion numbers, or simply quaternions. Now I shortly tell about it. The algebra of quaternions is discovered in 1843 by great William Rowan Hamilton in the flesh of genius, as it is written in a memorial plaque on the Quaternion Bridge in Dublin. It is the third good algebra in the small group of three algebras, including also the algebras of real and complex numbers. It is based on four units. One unit is a real scholar. The other three units are different imaginary vectors. Geometrically, these three unit vectors initiate a Cartesian coordinate system exactly as three mutually orthogonal gyroscope axes. Such vectors are called actual ones. It is clear that for such vectors the order of multipliers becomes important, so the quaternion algebra is not commutative. But the most remarkable fact is that it is still associative in multiplication and the Frobenius theorem, proved by the end of 19th century, states that it is the last good division algebra. 
Next in dimension, algebra of octonials is neither commutative nor associative. Thus, it is not good for description physics, since we don't know any non-associative physical quantity. So, the quaternion algebra is indeed distinguished one. This fact is confirmed by even deeper geometric properties. Namely, a thorough investigation shows that the three-dimensional space described by quaternion unit vectors has an interior geometric structure represented by a two-dimensional fractal space or fractal surface with dimensionality equal to one-half compared with the three-dimensional physical space. Analysis shows that the fractal surface can be deformed only in two ways. If we rotate the surface, the three-dimensional space is also rotating, though twice as fast. But this leaves good properties of the quaternion algebra intact. However, if you stretch the surface, then the basic quaternion vectors lose the property of units. The algebra gets a metric defect and it is spoiled. It turns out that we are able to save the algebra. This is done by introduction of a normalizing integral, geometrically meaning that the full distortion of the fractal surface, stretching and rotation simultaneously, occurs only in a local, very small area, so the metric defect is in a way neglected, while in the rest of the space the fractal surface is untouched. Moreover, if this condition permanently holds, then the algebra is saved forever. Mathematically, this means that the integral is constant with respect to a free parameter. Respective differential condition is the equation of discontinuity of the fractal space distortion in the three-dimensional world. In this equation, a free vector arises. It shows a geometric direction associated with three-dimensional space motion, or rather propagation, of this point-like fractal defect we can choose the vector arbitrarily. That's where a classification of equation begins. But it is necessary to stress, by the way, that all these equations and magnitudes are purely mathematical. They are not measured in any physical units. They become equation and magnitudes of physics if we relate dimensionless mathematical parameters with the space coordinates and time using some physical constants and coefficients. For instance, a dimensionless math coordinate may be regarded as a ratio of the physical coordinate and the Compton length equal to the Planck's constant divided by the electron's mass and fundamental velocity. In its turn, physical factor for time interval is the Compton length divided by the speed of light. So, transition from mathematics to physics here is realized by just introduction of a certain system of physical units. Well, now we are back to choice of the propagation vector appearing in the pure mathematical discontinuity equation. Consider the first simplest case when the propagation vector points increase of the phase of the fractal surface rotation. It is just a horse sense. The point-like object, the fractal defect, is propagating in the direction of increase of its phase. We insert this very simple definition of the free vector into discontinuity equation and obtain a fantastic result. The equation all of a sudden fractalizes. I mean that the equation from description of three-dimensional space magnitudes reduces to fractal mathematical functions. Moreover, 
it necessarily becomes complex number valued and gains an auxiliary term that we can choose arbitrarily. When we write this new equation in physical units, it becomes precisely the Schrodinger equation of quantum mechanics. It is really an exciting fact. From pure math, we deduce the equation that have been suggested by Erwin Schrodinger in 1926 from absolutely heuristic considerations in a flash of genius. The second choice of the propagation vector is the following. It similarly directs the phase increase, but on the background of some vector field. This choice gives us the result that is even more surprising. With this propagation vector, the equation also is fractalized, and in the physical units, it takes precise form of equation of Pauli describing a quantum particle with proper angular momentum, quantum spin. I'd like to remind that the non-trivial spin term has been added to the Schrodinger equation by Wolfgang Pauli intuitively, without any logical reasoning, again in a flash of genius. So, we surprisingly find that the schrodinger pauli equation in the midst of quaternion algebra is situated and it can be logically and mathematically strictly deduced. Thus, the equations of quantum mechanics are fundamental. They are the first to be born by quaternion math. The next is the equation of classical mechanics. It may be considered strange, but it appears on the basis of quantum mechanics, although usually college professors say that the two mechanics, I mean classical and quantum, are drastically different. I dare remind that correspondence between the two mechanics is traditionally sought for by making the Planck's constant to tend to zero. But this formal procedure, really strange for the dimensional constant, gives doubtful results. However, this is another way to come from quantum mechanics to the classical one. This way was firstly experienced by David Bohm, and it is quite evident disintegration of the Schrodinger equation into real and imaginary parts. The result is again surprising. The real part of the equation demonstrates just a mass conservation law. As to the imaginary part, it turns out to comprise two constituents, and they as well may be separated, provided their functions change differently within the physical space. The part whose functions change fast is a static equation describing distribution of matter inside the small volume containing the fractal metric defect. But the slow part is precisely the Hamilton-Jacobi equation of classical mechanics. It represents a direct consequence of equation of quantum mechanics in the case when we ignore interior peculiarity of a material point, and it is logically absolutely correct. From the hamilton jacobi equation, we straightforwardly arrive to the Lagrangian formalism and Newtonian dynamics. So, the classical mechanics discovered empirically in 17th century together with analytical mechanics of 19th century, actually meets its mathematical derivation hundreds of years later. But it is not at all the end. In the course of derivation, the quaternion mass gives us a distinct model of a point-like particle. It is a mass distributed inside a very small space volume, and it is very important this point-like object is permanently rotating about one axis with great angular frequency. 
We cannot detect this rotation because the object is really too small for our physical devices. But the rotation has great physical consequences and, what is not less strange, great mathematical consequences. First, the particle's invisible rotation reveals the mystery of mechanical action. This abstract function turns out to be nothing else but a half of the particle's phase rotation or full phase of the two-dimensional fractal space rotation. The second consequence is even more astonishing. Let us select a point at the particle's border at a very small radius, while this rotating particle is freely moving with a constant speed. Then the selected point depicts in the space a helix line. As well, let the particle be rotating maximally fast so that the velocity of the selected point is equal to the fundamental velocity. Under these conditions, we construct the line element of the helix, distinguish the rotation phase and express it through the velocity of light and the particle's speed. The result is again fantastic. We obtain an exact formula for the Lagrangian function of a relativistic particle. In the case when the particle's motion is not uniform, the helix line becomes non-regular, and then the helix born equation of the particle's motion acquires features of geodesic equation of general relativity. So the quaternion math decisively and directly leads us from quantum mechanics to classical mechanics, and finally to relativistic mechanics. All three mechanical branches originate from a unique mathematical root. They emerge one after another in physically logical consequence from fractal entities interpreted as quantum objects to classical objects first with ordinary and then with relativistic properties. However, a question arises. What can we say about relativistic quantum mechanics? Of course, we have an answer, although it sounds a little formal. Namely, I remind that there is a free choice of the propagation vector in the mathematical discontinuity equation aimed to save the quaternion algebra. If we choose the vector in the generalized four-dimensional form, then the original equation acquires the form of the four-dimensional Klein-Gordon equation. There are several ways to find its square root version. Among them, the variant once successfully realized by Paul Dirac. However, quaternion mathematics admits other variants of fractalizations. For instance, the simplest quaternion square root from the space-time interval leads to a specific vector version of special relativity. I published it in 2008. See in the Internet quaternion model of relativity. However, it is quite a different story. We will talk about it one day. The paper described the general theory of mechanics in detail is published in 2015 in the journal Gravitation and Cosmology. Thank you all.